And we're back on Consumer Choice Radio. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our next guest. Um, Our next guest is coming to us from the safety of Norway. She's the former Afghan acting minister of Mines, Petroleum, and Industries, the founder of Equality for Peace and Democracy, and the first woman to hold a leadership role with the Central Bank of Afghanistan. Welcome to the show, Nargis Nihan. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Well, so uh, right off the bat, I mean, obviously, Afghanistan, your home, is a, is a different country today than it was just a few months ago. Can you explain to our listeners what it was like to have to flee your country? Um, it's a very hard decision. Uh, because it's the second time that um, I will, I left Afghanistan. Uh, first time I was uh, a child, uh, 11 years old, and we had to go by road uh, to Pakistan. And uh, I didn't know a lot, but I knew that something is seriously wrong about our country. And uh, my family is uh, struggling to take us somewhere safe. Uh, but beyond that, I didn't know anything. I neither knew the problem and I didn't know the solution. Uh, this time it was different because uh, first we were not uh, ready and we couldn't believe that things will fall apart so quickly. Uh, but unfortunately, with the departure of the president, uh, former president and all his colleagues, uh, that created a vacuum in Kabul where uh, uh, Taliban came and they took Kabul and it was a big shock for all of us because we were not ready for it. Uh, so um, things began to change. I remember the day that Taliban took Kabul. Um, in the morning, I went to office and things seemed normal in the morning when I went to office. Uh, I remember three to four hours I had to leave back because my brother called me and he said that uh, they are in a different corner of Kabul. It's better that you, uh, you close the office and you go back home. But when I left office, when I came back, when I went out to go to my house, I faced a totally different city. Uh, It was already empty. Uh, People were panicking around. Uh, There was no police. There was uh, uh, no government uh, vehicle or anything. Everything suddenly disappeared. Uh, So we went there, we packed our things, and we uh, had to quickly shift to one of our relatives' house, and we had to stay with them. Uh, So this continued for uh, almost 10 days until we managed to get evacuated with the support of Norwegians. Uh, It was not easy because, um, first of all, it was very difficult because imagine we built a life again uh, for the second time for 20 years, and we were very much hoping that we will continue to build Afghanistan and hand over a different uh, country to the next generation, and the next generation should not go through what we went through. But the history exactly repeated itself. We were all panicking. We were in different houses. Most of us were hiding. Uh, We went to airport three times. Uh, First time we couldn't get, for hours we wait and we couldn't get into the gate even. We had to come back. Second time we got closer to uh, to the gate, but then my father fainted and we had to quickly take him to hospital. And most of us had to go in hiding again. And finally, last time we managed to leave, but it was a very hard decision because we couldn't take my father with me and my sister and a brother-in-law had to stay behind to take care of him while the staff has managed to flee with the support of Norwegian government. So a very hard decision, uh, very difficult, uh, but then in the meantime, it was a fourth decision. We did not have any other choice except this. So uh, I definitely want to discuss a lot of the, the different efforts that you made, not just for uh, furthering along education and rights for women, but also for uh, the public finances of Afghanistan and actual business administration. And uh, just a, a short question on that. You know, do you have um, any colleagues or, or friends or others who actually decided to stay or what would have happened had you stayed? Are there perhaps circumstances that you've become aware of or, or just um, additional people perhaps that uh, unfortunately were not able to get out? Uh, I mean, even uh, I remember when I, I was actually approached uh, by the Canadian government, even before the Norwegian government, and they offered me 
for evacuation and uh, they said you can, I can submit the application for seeking asylum under the special program that, uh, uh, that they had announced for Afghans. My response to them was that, no, I'm not going anywhere. I know life is going to be very different and it's going to be a lot more difficult once Taliban comes to Kabul. But I prefer that difficult life instead of leaving everything behind me uh, and go to another country. Uh, so many of us made that decision, but suddenly when the Taliban took Kabul uh, and with the, with the policies that they began to come uh, force on women, that demonstrated that they haven't changed a lot. And those of us uh, that actually had to stay uh, because uh, many could not evacuate their family members and they didn't have passports or they couldn't get to the uh, crowd in the airport, they are all in hiding. Uh, those women that they organized the recent demonstrations that I'm sure you uh, must have followed in the media uh, against you know, like their job being taken, everything, uh, we are in contact with them. They are all the time hiding from one house to another house because uh, things have become much more difficult. Uh, Taliban are going after uh, women's rights activists, after journalists, after ex uh, uh, civil servants and national security forces. And they are brutally uh, killing them in front of their family members uh, outside. So it's a very difficult life for those that they have stayed behind. And especially for women, it also means that they are back in dark ages where they're just sitting as prisoners at home and they can't do anything. You, you mentioned the, the dark ages in regards to the treatment of women. Can you explain to our listeners the progress that was made over that 20 year period in regards to how women are treated in the country and the advancements of women? I mean. Obviously, you holding a senior uh, leadership position in government is a, is a signal that things got significantly better. Um, but for those who may not know or may not understand uh, what the difference is between Afghanistan, let's say three months ago, versus Afghanistan in a month from now. So to be very honest uh, to, uh, to you all, um, even life for Afghan women before the capture of Taliban was not easy. We always had a saying that we were using amongst ourselves. We were saying that if you're really a man, uh, come and live as a woman in Afghanistan. Then you would understand what a tough and difficult life is. Uh, so Afghanistan is a male-dominated society. Afghanistan has been in conflict uh, in the last four decades. And that has made people much more brutal towards each other uh, and harsh towards each other and uh, in like less, with less empathy. And women have been always the victim of all the violences and conflict within the family and in the society. Uh, but the, the difference that we had was that we had women that we were fighting. So the glass was not that hard to break it. Uh, we also had the um, support of the uh, previous government, at least, uh, you know, like symbolically. Uh, and then we also had uh, general support of the international community, financially and as well as politically. So that made a lot, a lot of difference for us. So imagine the girls' uh, educa uh, participation in, in, in education was zero in 2001 under Taliban rule. But then suddenly we managed to get 40% uh, of the girls to, to schools. And that's a, that's a huge number. That's a big difference. 5% uh, of the uh, uh, university students were women. Uh, on top of that, 50% of the uh, teachers were women. More than 40% of civil servants were women. More than 3,500 women uh, entrepreneurs had the businesses where beside themselves, they were also creating employment for others. We had 27% of our parliament comprised of uh, female parliamentarians and 38% of the provincial uh, council members were women. On top of that, we had women as uh, ministers, not only in those typical ministries such as Ministry of Women's Affairs, Labor and Social Affairs or Education, we also had women leading uh, a difficult sector such as mining myself. Uh, one of our deputies was a woman and our minister of uh, communication was a woman. So these were all the progresses that we made. Yes, life was very difficult, but the difference was that we were hopeful. We knew that we can fight for our rights. It's going to be a hard uh, struggle, but we can continue. There's a hope. And the difference that we have now is that there's not that hope. Uh, more than uh, 
2 million uh, Afghans are uh, actually being uh, uh, fed by women. That means that their breadwinners are women, the families that, um, that either the husbands are being killed or they're being murdered uh, because they were working. Because Afghanistan, I'm sure you must have heard that has a lot, a very high casualty, not only in the security sector, but also civilians. So all yeah. families were left behind for women to take care of them. Those women were working as teachers, they were working as civil servants, they were working in angels, they were working in different sectors, feeding their family. Suddenly, since one and a half months, they are at home, they don't have any job, they don't have any salary, they have not only themselves, but more than six to seven members of the family who are looking up to them for, uh, uh, for feeding them. Uh, and they don't, they cannot even get out of their houses. So life is very difficult. And I must say that it's actually worse than present right now uh, for Afghan women. At least in prisons, the prisoners are, 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 are provided with three times food uh, and, 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 and in like a shelter. Right now, even there is no one to take that responsibility for Afghan women. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry to hear that uh, the Canadian government uh, did not go forward because David and I are both Canadian and it would have been great to, to have been involved in, in getting you to Canada. Uh, regardless, though, um, you had mentioned, you know, s- some of the, the aspects of what's happened uh, over the course of the last few weeks. Um, but I, I really do hope that people get to know your name a lot more and definitely your story. And uh, much of it is very encouraging and an inspiration. And I, I think because the media coverage on so much is, is focused, at least from our countries, more on uh, you know, the war aspect, uh, the money and the guns and everything else, but you actually had a significant hand in following many great reforms when it comes to finances, when it comes to natural resources. Uh, what was that kind of like, uh, becoming a minister and uh, focusing on things like mining and petroleum and trying to attract foreign investment uh, sort of what was that transition like for you? Uh, I want to share my two, three actually major experiences that uh, I want to demonstrate that it's not only me, but there are many, many women like me in Afghanistan that actually they have been leading change and transformation in the Afghan society then, and, and never accepted to be a victim, even if people try to, uh, to discriminate us from time to time. So 2002, my family was in Pakistan. As soon as the interim government of Afghanistan was established with the support of international community, I packed my bag and I immediately left for Kabul. My family was in shock. They said, how could you leave? We are all here. I said, you can continue your life, but I'm going back because I want to take a, a reserve part in the construction of my country. So I came and I left on my own as a single young 23 years old woman and trying to find my way to be able to take part in the construction of my country. I was immediately appointed as a director general for treasury department in Ministry of Finance. And I was dealing with all warlords where they were keeping money and they were not sending it to treasury. And I had to come with systematic reform to be able to stop them from doing that. So I can proudly tell you that today, even today, the, the financial management system that's being used by the Afghan government was the system that I put it in place, Afghan and financial management information system that we call it AFNIS. Through that system, we managed to consolidate all resources of the government. That means that we managed to centralize all revenue of the country and we were able to decentralize expenditures of the country. Uh, for the first time, sad teachers were being paid for by the Kabul government rather than neighboring uh, provinces supporting each other because there was not that kind of system in Kabul to get all the revenue and disperse back this expenditure. So we call it that the treasury single account reform, which is very famous and many reports are written about it. Second experience was um, uh, when I felt that uh, I can no longer be effective in the government. In 2009, I decided to leave my job, although I was I had the good reputation and I was provided very good consultancies uh, in different government uh, institutions. But I said, if I'm not effective, I'm not leaving. I came uh, out and I 
uh, in the civil society, I established an organization called Equality for Peace and Democracy. And for the first time, I began to mobilize and especially engage women in the good governance that houses citizens, they can monitor government budgeting system, expenditure, monitor the services and demand uh, for better rights and also fight corruption in their communities. So we had many, many cases where actually women were identifying corruption and they were fighting it from the beginning till end on like exactly how uh, um, uh, on improving the service delivery in their communities. What is more important that we also established women networks in 20 provinces of Afghanistan, where these women as local leaders were always helping and trying to be there for their communities. They managed to resolve more than 1,100 disputes and conflicts in their communities because we were providing them with the technical skills on exactly how they would do it, not only based on the uh, conflict resolution that we are uh, learning from based on the international norms, but also based on the Islamic perspective, we were uh, training them so that they could go to the communities, they could identify the conflicts, they could sit with them, and then based on the Islamic perspective, help them to resolve their conflict peacefully. Uh, that is the second example. The third one is Ministry of Mines and Petroleum. The reason that I offered that job, it was a very difficult one. Uh, still many of my friends are telling me that perhaps it was not a wise decision. I say to according to me, it was a wise decision. I said it's important that we somebody just needs to get that sector and demonstrate that women can also work in this sector. So I managed to go there as a minister. And the day that I went, I started trying to uh, develop the sector. It was, uh, I mean, I didn't have any problem with civil servants, men and women. They were very much cooperative those that they were interested to see the sector de being developed, they were cooperating with me because they could see that I was very open to listen to them, develop programs with them, and jointly uh, uh, implement uh, reform initiatives with them. But I faced a lot of problems by my male counterparts, other ministers, the some uh, officials uh, and uh, advisors close to the office of the president, because they were seeing me more in like, they could not believe that there is a woman who basically wants to do things on her own. She would take your advice, but there is no guarantee that she would implement those advice. And on top of that, she wants things to be done inside the ministry. So it was a huge change for them to see that a woman is there. She wants to lead everything on her, on her, on her own. She wants to lead, to, to take all the responsibility. Even when the blame was coming on the ministry, I was taking it just to show them that I'm a responsible leader. Uh, so it was difficult for them to digest it. And, and I never gave up. Um, and I had several fights inside the system. Finally, when I resigned in, 2000, in October 2019 from my position, it was because of the high corruption in the system that I saw and sexual harassment of young women that I saw. And I several times went and talked to president about it and some others, and I said, you need to stop this. This is not acceptable. But then we got to the point that I couldn't take it anymore. And then I publicly, I made it public and I resigned from my position because for me, uh, those principles were much more important than keeping a ministerial position. And by that time, I also felt that the system and the government was not up for any kind of reform anymore. They, they were more focused on the second round of election and they, the, the priority was not governance anymore. So that was not my cup of tea. So I thought it's better that I just resign and focus back on my activities in the civil society. So it's not only me, there are hundreds and thousands of women in different sectors that they have gone out of their way and they have demonstrated. If you are a successful woman uh, in Afghanistan, uh, trust me, it's, a, it's very extraordinary because it's a very difficult country, especially for women. Uh, by the time that I left uh, uh, EPD, the organization that I, uh, I, uh, I founded, it was working already in 20 provinces, having more than 200 employees. So that says a lot about you know, how much I could do just in four years that I was working with EPD. I mean, that's a, that is an incredible story. Um, I, I certainly appreciate the um, your explanation of, um, of your counterparts having difficulty dealing with uh, a strong, independent, and capable woman. Um, that's obviously something that will resonate for so many who hear that story, um, whether they be in Afghanistan or elsewhere. Um, in closing, our last question for you is, what can people do who are listening, what can they do to help the Afghan people or to help rebuild um, 
the country? Or is that even possible given the current circumstances? Uh, my message is to the uh, listener, to your listeners, or that first of all, do not see Afghan women as victims. Um, yes, there we have been suppressed. We are still being suppressed, but still we are not victims. It's, it's a, we are passing a very difficult life, uh, but still we are trying to stand for the uh, for the cause that we believe in, and that is the equality, liberty, freedom. So what is happening in Afghanistan today is a testing time for all of us, for anyone who believes in human rights, for anyone who believes in equality and women's rights. So I keep on saying, and I'm saying that every message is making a difference, every tweet is making a difference, and every retweet is making a difference. So please continue to monitor on what is happening. And many of us are there constantly writing in social media about trying to update on what is happening in Afghanistan, uh, attending different programs and giving update on what is happening in Afghanistan. Please hold your government accountable and push for your government that they constructively engage with the Taliban and they put a list, of, a list of condition for the Taliban to meet before they recognize the government of Taliban. And um, women's rights, humans' rights, minorities' rights, and open government, inclusive government, and allowing the women uh, groups and organizations to continue their activities should be on top of those uh, conditions. Because right now they have closed, uh, they are not allowing any uh, women's rights organization to, uh, to, to start their activity. They have closed our offices, they have frozen our bank account, and uh, and we haven't been able to pay even our staff for the last two to three months just because everything is frozen. We are trying to find our way out of this, but it's going to be very hard for us to do it without support of the international community because end of the day, we are dealing with a very different group in comparison to the previous government because this group is barbaric and they believe in, in a pushing and, and making things happen by power of the gun rather than the pen. So for us who believes in power of pen, fighting with people who believes in gun is going to be very difficult, but I'm sure that together we can make this happen. And if we manage, if we manage to maintain the woman's right and rise back again, like as a, together as in like men and women who believes in human rights, that is going to set a model for the whole world and especially for the Islamic countries that there is no way that the world is going to deal with the groups that they're going to suppress everybody. So it's a testing time for us. Whatever we do today with Afghanistan and Afghan women, that is going to set the precedent for other Islamic countries and later on for and like other countries in the region. So we hope that we look at that bigger picture and then based on that, come together and make sure that we support the Afghan women with the struggle that we're having. Well, thank you very much um, for that. And thank you very much for joining our program. We do really appreciate it. And we'll be sure to have you on again um, in a few months time to get an update about what's going on and what life is looking like. And if the international community really does hold the Taliban uh, accountable to their commitments in regards to how they treat women. And um, I certainly hope that they will. Um, I don't know if they will, um, but it's on us. Uh, to, to keep our um, to keep our ears to the ground and to make sure that our respective governments uphold that part of the agreement and make sure that um, the 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 success and the prosperity and equality for women um, in whatever way possible is is something that's um, a cornerstone in what's next for Afghanistan. So thank you again very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.